Uh, good evening, friends, and uh, we're back on the live stream. Tim Kirby, Russia here. Uh, so this one's going to be a little long one because you have a big topic. Our topic for today is real estate in Russia. You know, friends, um, uh, I asked recently what topics people wanted for um, live streams. Uh, probably the best answer, which I thought was pretty interesting, would be for myself and uh, Mr. Afanasi uh, to, uh, or, well, I should say, um, uh, for Andrei Afanasyev, uh, to uh, sit down and uh, do like a like a big historical breakdown of the entirety of Russian history. That's kind of a cool idea for a project. I will keep that in mind. Uh, maybe not the best idea for just a live stream. Uh, of some of the remaining ideas, uh, I think the one that uh, sparked my interest for tonight is uh, the uh, sort of uh, is Russian real estate. So that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, obviously, we've talked about that uh, a lot, um, but I don't think I've ever done like a big like all-encompassing breakdown of the issue so anyways it's a good issue to talk about you guys might have some questions uh, as usual uh, if you want to talk to me later let me go through my spiel first uh, later you can use the raise your hand function to talk to me uh, or you can write comments pretty much anywhere on tim kirby russia hardcore where you're watching this and it all goes to one place that i refer to as the chat so any messages you write or comments, I should say, will all go to the same place. So if we're going to talk about the uh, history and sort of uh, where why real estate in Russia is the way it is, obviously we can't ignore the fact that uh, Russia was, <laughs> and it was is uh, connected to its ancient medieval roots. So we have to think of things not in terms of how, like, you know, the United States was built, but in terms of, um, you know, how ancient Eurasian civilizations were built where, you know, uh, people used to live in mostly small villages and about 80% of the population were farmers, so to say, serfs and all that, um, of various sorts. And, uh, that was your medieval society. There weren't many cities. And so as you go around, uh, Russia, you can see that there are, you know, a lot of, uh, villages of various degrees of activity, uh, some dying, some not, uh, kind of dotted between uh, major cities that kind of became like the capitals of regions. So if you were to uh, go, uh, you know, a thousand years ago from Moscow down south to Tula, they both existed, I'm pretty sure, because Tula was like one of the major hubs between Moscow and Kiev uh, and one of the major uh, defensive posts. But anyways, you'd go there and then eventually you'd hit uh, something that was probably in the position of Podolsk today, then my glorious Chekhov, which I believe was called Lepasnya in ancient times, uh, and then you'd hit Serpukhov, which was a kind of small town, and eventually you'd get to Tula itself with uh, probably some little villages along that uh, route where travelers would go. And so that's kind of... Um, on, on the very basics of why Russia, especially the more central part of Russia, as it's called, the part around Moscow, uh, why it looks the way it looks is because it was built in medieval times. But obviously not all of Russia was, uh, because Russia, especially the Far East and Siberia, was built later on, after medieval times, uh, especially the Far East. So not all of Russia uh, behaves like that, but you kind of have to think of where the times began. But all of modern Russia was affected by the Soviet Union. So, first off, with the Soviet Union, you get into the concept of not having private property, but having personal property. Okay, that was one of their concepts. So, uh, I've heard a lot of debates between different people of whether in the Soviet Union you actually owned your apartment, or whether it was sort of like you kind of had the rights to one particular part of the government's property or something like that. But ultimately, uh, I don't want to get into some... Uh, pedantic nitpick fest, especially when I don't actually have the answer to that. Uh, maybe one day I can uh, talk to a good Soviet historian about how they actually saw things. But they had the policy of personal property as opposed to private property in the West. That is a fact. And long story short, uh, everyone in the Soviet Union um, had the right to go somewhere and live, uh, especially as time went on. And uh, especially after they started building a million billion apartment buildings after Russia was blown up. Uh, in World War II. So we also get uh, part of the reason Russia is sort of the way it is and its real estate market behaves the way it does is because uh, when uh, the Soviet Union ended, uh, in theory, everyone had a place to live. In theory, right? And so Russia had or still has a very high level 
of home ownership. Uh, on the dark side, remember, you know, in more warm countries, let's just say being homeless is a lot easier and more survivable than it is in Russia. So something to kind of keep in mind. But anyways, uh, Russia continues to have a pretty high, uh, a very low amount of homelessness and a fairly decent amount of home ownership, especially in comparison to like Western European countries where, you know, your average German teenager has no hope of ever buying a place to live, right? So uh, that also whole, the whole breakup of the Soviet Union and all that adds to the character of all things. Now, one thing that was definitely a negative was that in the Soviet Union, uh, when they planned uh, the first Khrushchevki, as in the par the apartment buildings uh, made by Khrushchev, uh, the very first sort of mass-produced public housing, um, one major, I would say, mistake was that they essentially took people and they sort of went around and they measured, like, how much space does it take to take off your coat without bashing your arms into the wall? How much space does it actually take to sit down on a uh, modern toilet and do your business, then stand up and wipe your butt. All that other stuff. Sorry, those are kind of those are kind of crude example, but uh, you get my point. Uh, how much space does it take to do this, that, or the other? And they sort of uh, researched that and gave everyone what they believe to be the absolute minimum amount of space. Thankfully, a lot of people in Russia are fairly big, so at least. <laughs> Things are a lot better than they are in Singapore or Hong Kong. I can tell you that much, or especially in Tokyo. Uh, but uh, so this minimum is actually much bigger than in many uh, crowded Asian countries. But still, you know, that that communist thinking of we will give you only the absolute minimum amount of space to poop uh, is kind of um, BS. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why the sort of the Khrushchevki is a phenomenon you know, they had, their, they had their pluses and their minuses. Um, I do remember the tale of one person telling me that their um, great-grandmother moved from the village into a Khrushchevka apartment. And uh, so this is the 1960s. So her great-grandmother's a person, you know, from like the 1800s or... They remember the Tsar. And anyway, she said, wow, in our city, it's always summer. And this person said, well, grandma or great-grandma... Why Why do you believe that? Why do you say that? She said, because it's always hot in here. You know, because you don't have to, like, there's no necessity to, like, heat some sort of, sort of Russian oven with wood or you don't do anything. You know, you're just in this room and it's hot. So you have to also understand that given some of the contexts of, uh, you know, the, the, the backgrounds of a lot of people who are especially, you know, uh, I wouldn't say former serfs, because serfdom ended at about the time slavery ended in the United States, but maybe not serfs, but like, let's just say rural people, uh, you know, for them, uh, these apartment buildings provided this life of insane leisure. There's, you know, for them, they're like, what you're saying is, I go to work for a factory for just eight hours a day, and then, and then and I don't have to do anything else. I just go there, and I go stampy stampy all day long, and then I go home, and I do nothing. Sounds good. So for those kind of people, it actually sounded like a pretty sweet deal at the time. But, you know, as time went on, um, people wanted more and more. And already by the Brezhnev period, uh, the sort of concept of people deserve the absolute bare minimum, it was still there, but the bare minimum got a little bit bigger. If you look at sort of Brezhnev era apartments, uh, if you can spot them or ask people when these were built, uh, they definitely tend to be a little bit more... Uh, luxurious, slightly bigger, and uh, they definitely have elevators if they're six floors or taller. <laughs> a lot of the early Khrushchevka <laughs> did not have elevators. Um, so Brezhnev, lord of elevators. I can't believe how many elevators must have been produced uh, during Brezhnev's reign. A freaking lot. Um, and especially some of the older buildings that were five or six stories tall or higher had to be refurbished. So uh, while you still can, before all those old buildings are knocked down in Moscow, you can still see some where they had to like uh, like uh, graft uh, the uh, elevator shaft outside the building. So like the elevator shaft is sticking and hanging off the side of a building, um, the outside of it, because they had to put one in um, for legal reasons within the uh, Soviet Union. So you do get into some of those weird buildings um, where the elevator shaft is just shoved on the side. And of course, because the building wasn't designed for an elevator, it means the elevator shaft is usually in between floors. It's sort of like where, um, 
like where the two floors meet, uh, if that makes sense, because it's not planned. So it's sort of like if the, if the staircase goes like this, up, 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 uh, you know, it kind of goes in between the levels because it's easier to sort of shove it in there. So, uh, yeah, not exactly the um, best system that has ever been made on uh, God's Green Earth, but uh, whatever, good enough. <laughs> so, so there's that. That can affect uh, real estate, whether something has the, an elevator or not, uh, because a lot of the buildings in the 1960s didn't. And if you were in a region of Russia that has less money, you probably didn't get your uh, elevator slapped on your building. We'll put it that way. So as time goes on and we enter into the 90s and we have capitalism, true, everyone sort of had a place to live, but a lot of these places were kind of crappy and very minimalistic. Uh, and one other problem that happens is when the Soviet Union breaks up, say five adults are registered at one place, very often people had to live with quite a few people um, within uh, a one apartment. In fact, I was just watching a documentary where they said at the beginning of like the Khrushchevka period, uh, pure blood, we're going to talk to you later, so keep your hand up, we'll talk later. Um, the Khrushchevka period, it was something, or the, it, was, oh, it was the, actually no, it was the beginning of like the Soviet period, so during the revolutionary period, there's something like five square meters of living space per person, and living space doesn't include like the toilet or the bathroom, living space. Something like that, and, and actually, uh, by Russia's own uh, metrics, it's unhealthy to live or to work with more the people than provide six square meters of space. Living space in modern Russia is supposed to be something like 10 square meters of space per person, something like that. Um, so anyways, it was actually below uh, sanitary norms that are in Russia today, the way people lived in the uh, uh, revolutionary period of Russia. But by the end of the Soviet Union, I think it worked out to be nine, they said, something like nine square meters per person or eight square meters per person, which is above the working minimum, but not above the modern living minimum to prevent uh, all sorts of nasty diseases and contagions. Uh, because if you shove a bunch of people into one tiny space, uh, they apparently get sick. So... Yeah. So even by the end of the Soviet Union, although there was more space, uh, things weren't perfect. And so you get in this weird thing that you have to be aware of if you're going to buy uh, anything that already exists in Russia or was built, especially in the Soviet Union, uh, is that uh, a lot of these uh, residences were sort of sliced uh, into various different ownerships. So, for example, uh, if you live in a one room apartment, but you lived with like, you know, you have a mom, dad, a brother, sister. Uh, you know, that apartment could have been divided into four uh, portions or something. Or during the 90s, for whatever reason, uh, a lot of these apartments got divided and divided uh, into various different small chunks. And so that's why you might see a great deal on an apartment on some website. But you have to be careful because are you really buying the whole apartment or are you merely buying one room or maybe one fifth of one room? Something to be aware of. Uh, because there's a certain, I forget how much you can divide one piece of real estate, but a lot of people to get access to some of the goodies of Moscow in the past have like bought 140th, I think it's the smallest amount, like 140th of an, apart 40th of an apartment in Moscow in order to get registered at that apartment and then use all of Moscow's uh, lovely facilities and uh, uh, be able to work here. Because uh, in the past, uh, where you were registered really had an effect on like taking out a loan, getting a job and all that. And over time that has really, boy, has that faded into history that, that, that doesn't really matter anymore at all, but in the past it did. And so you do get this sort of weird situation where there's all sorts of super mega subdivided, uh, old apartments due to the breakup of the Soviet union. Uh, that phenomenon, I don't really remember happening much in America. Maybe I'm sure it's happened somewhere where someone, uh, died and uh, their kids fought over some house. Maybe that's happened in American history. America's a big freaking country. <laughs> so I bet uh, something like that has happened somewhere, but it's definitely not common. That's for darn sure. So that's something that's also very a unique phenomenon um, to um, Russia. And another thing <clears throat> with the shift to private property and the chaos of the 90s is one of the reasons, and it's probably the, maybe the best thing, even better than the, the low taxes on real estate in Russia, <coughs> is that uh, nothing in Russia is abandoned, in the government's opinion. There is no such thing as like, if you don't use property, you lose it. Uh, even if you don't pay your property taxes for a long time, they're not going to take it away from you. That is great. That is true 
true property rights. Unlike in a lot of countries, like we're seeing in uh, the United Kingdom, where uh, there's been a new uh, wave. This is this is not a, a new phenomenon, but a new wave of squatters' rights, where if someone uh, manages to sneak in your house while you're not there, they have some sort of claim to it as squatters. No, in Russia, there are no squatters. In fact, one of the things to look out for is, uh, you know, a crooked landlord could take your money, you could live there one day, and then he calls the cops and says, I don't know who this guy is, get him the hell out of here. That's the dark side to it. Uh, but uh, on the uh, more positive side of things, you know, your property is never abandoned. And that's one thing I've kind of faced with talking to the American village is everyone, be they Russians themselves, because remember, Russians don't know their own laws and don't really care to, uh, and a lot of foreign people is that they're always like, well, why don't you go into some abandoned village? And Because so, you can't. Because every abandoned village, uh, if it exists on the big, fat, magical uh, map that the government has of Russia, it belongs to someone somewhere, and tracking them down is not easy. And if it doesn't belong to anyone, then it's a question of how do you get the government to then give it to you, which is also not easy to do. Uh, so that's definitely one thing that's that's different. Like uh, uh, in Japan, uh, for a fact, I do know that uh, if someone dies and they have no heirs, like they immediately just sell that property. The government sort of takes it and tries to sell it off to someone, so someone lives there. In Italy, they have that like one dollar house program for people. Um, even in Cleveland, I think we had for some time, like because they wanted to get people to move downtown, a one dollar house program. Just please, please go live in the ghetto and and don't commit crimes, please, guys. Please come move to Cleveland. So that uh, can't exist in Russia. That's really not an option. Um, that is that is not the way that Russia rolls, baby. Uh, there is sometimes some sort of like officially abandoned property that the that the government auctions off, uh, but they have to auction it off based on the value that they estimate uh, on their uh, magic map. And even then, <coughs> winning those auctions um, and. Uh, <clears throat> Getting something actually put up for auction because it could look very corruption flavored is uh, not easy. So that's another huge difference <clears throat> between you know England where you have squatters' rights. <laughs> Try doing that here, uh, uh, where in Italy you have these one dollar houses, and in Japan you seem to have a similar kind of one dollar house concept. So as long as someone lives somewhere, uh, everyone's happy. That is not the case here um, uh, whatsoever. Um, so what's the next thing? Yeah, I just mentioned that taxes are extremely low because uh, the taxes are not based on the retail value of a home, but they're based on the government's magical cadastral value. Uh, I don't even know if that's a word that exists in the English language, but everyone says it. In, like the Russian people who speak English, I'll say it. So we'll believe that the term cadastral value uh, exists in English. We'll pretend it's that way. It might be something else. But the cadastral value, or perhaps government estimated value, is generally about eight to ten times less than something is worth. Another one, I'll talk to you later, but not right now. We're still in the big spiel. Um, that uh, is uh, one of the reasons why taxes are so low, because it's based on actually kind of a similar number to some countries. They'll be like, uh, the taxes on a piece of real estate are like one-tenth of one percent in some countries, or one-half, like a, like a twentieth of a percent, I should say, one-half of a tenth of a percent is one twentieth, uh, you know, one twentieth of a percent. Well, in Russia, they do have a sort of sort of zone like that. But the thing is, the uh, estimation of the value of the property property is so absurdly low that you're talking about, you know, one tenth of one percent of something that has already been divided by ten. So what is that? Uh, uh, one tenth of a hundred is a th one ten thousandth. Would it work out to be the math of something? I don't know. Maybe I'm doing that wrong. Uh, you don't come here for math lessons. But anyways, that's one of the reasons why taxes are so insane. Real estate taxes are insanely low in Russia. Uh, another thing is that you can pay your real estate taxes online every September if you create a Gos Uslugi account. What does Gos Uslugi mean? Gos, Gosudarstva, the state. Uslugi, services. Uh, if you create an account on the uh, Russian state website, then you uh, automatically get informed of when you need to pay your taxes, and you do it, and it's amazing. And as of last year, for three pieces of property that I own, I paid $22. So there you go. Uh, the magic. I was worried that the apartment in Moscow would be really judged uh, to be, let's just say, uh, much differently than Chekhov, but no. It was not. Uh, let's see. Um, another thing is, oh, I need to find that image. Did I save that image? Well, I'm going to have to blow it up on the other screen. Hold on. 
We're gonna do it if it if it works. Hold on, hold on. Okay, there we go. All right, it's on the other screen. I'm gonna zoom in. Let's hope this doesn't screw up. Okay, here we go. Share screen. All right, it didn't screw up. Fantastic. So I hope you guys can see this. Uh, it's gonna look weird because I'm gonna have to actually look at the actual screen it's on and not at you because over here. Or maybe I can enlarge this. Maybe it'll look okay. All right, that's all right. Uh, if you look at this chart, uh, it shows uh, like um, this is obviously for houses, not apartment buildings. But it actually shows some of the uh, <laughs> the very few rules there are uh, about how you build your dacha. Uh, one interesting thing you might notice on this uh, chart that you have to obey is it doesn't really mention much about how you build your dacha. It basically says that a, a home, this says a residential home, needs to be five meters away from the street. Apparently, three meters away from some sort of walking... Oh, wait, here's the, here's the mouse. Five meters away from the, from a street where like a car could drive. Three meters away from a street, a walking street. Uh, three meters away from the uh, fence of your neighbor. And uh, yeah, that's how you place your home on your property. Uh, apparently, if you want to make some sort of pool or something, the pool has to be three meters away from the edge. Uh, bushes one meter away from the edge, from your the edge of your neighbor's property. So you could put that pool right up against the main street to show off how wealthy you are which I would recommend to make those plebeians uh, jealous. Uh, anyways, you got like a, a, a high tree has to be four meters away. Uh, a gazebo, everyone's favorite word, has to be one meter away from your neighbor's uh, territory. A banya, basically everything pretty much has to be at least one meter away from the edge of your property. It's supposed to be. Uh, I think that's so you, can, so you could get back there or if some sort of emergency happened, like a fireman or someone could get like around everything. So pretty much everything has to be at least one meter. Uh, but I guess one of the more important things is that your uh, well needs to be eight meters away from where you go poopy. Uh, so you don't poop in your own water. So there you go, guys. Uh, and your compost heap, which is this thing at the bottom. Uh, Got to have everything eight meters away from where you get your water. But in many places in Russia, you'd have to drill for water, you know, I don't know, 20 meters or 30 or 40 or 50 or whatever below ground. So it kind of doesn't even matter where you go poopies. Uh, yeah, but uh, if you're using an actual traditional well, uh, you got to give yourself some space as to not get sick. Uh, why your banya has to be eight meters away from your house, I think that's a fire safety thing. If the banya goes up, if it's eight meters away, it should just burn down on its own. So anyways, uh, there you go. That's how you, uh, those are, that's how you, uh, plan your dacha. Amazing. Uh, and now it's back to me and I am very big on my own monitor. That is terrifying absolutely terrifying so anyways <clears throat> i gotta get you, you guys back here gotta get the chat back here uh perhaps that was interesting for someone um and about zoning uh remember that uh, zoning laws in russia are um uh not as complicated as some countries definitely not the united states uh, so much there's basically uh like um uh, a single family residence zoning like in america uh, there's, you know, one for farming and then one for dachas and there's an industrial one and a commercial one. I believe there's sort of like six overall types of zoning um, and uh, it's it's very similar to other countries. Maybe, again, a big difference between Russia and North America is that uh, when you build an apartment building, which are more common than in America, you can put all sorts of stores and stuff on the first floor. Uh, you can essentially build at your dacha whatever the hell you want, including like a store that faces the street. Uh, as long as it's, you know, again, uh, X number of meters off the road, uh, so far and so forth. So that that's a big thing. You have a lot more freedom to have, like, businesses all over the place. And that makes Russia a little bit more convenient because if you live in a high-rise apartment, you can just go down and visit all the businesses. You, there's a very good chance that you have a grocery store in your building on the first floor or the next building on the first floor. And that is very convenient for urban living. Um, it's also very convenient that the government really doesn't care what you build on your own property uh, a lot of the times. Uh, so uh, you can see some pretty wacky, fun dodges out there where people go nuts. So there you go. But uh, as you should know, foreigners, as I've mentioned before, which ties into the American village under normal, normal circumstances, foreign people can't buy land. So you're screwed till you get citizenship, <laughs> unfortunately. But uh, obviously there's ways around it, and that's why I'm here. But, uh, yeah, anyways, so, uh, zoning, I mean, it is a thing in Russia, um, but, um, it's a little bit different than in America and people aren't really as so, um, 
again, pedantic about it. So, yeah. Um, ba, ba, ba. And one thing that's definitely weird is you really can't, uh, they've tried to change it. I don't know if they actually did, but uh, you're really not supposed to build anything besides storage on farmland. So it's kind of hard to build a family farm. You might have to actually kind of cut that piece off and rezone it or something. But um, anyways, sometimes people do because no one checks and no one ultimately cares. Uh, also, uh, if you have a cheese making facility attached to a building that you could sleep in, is it really a house? Probably not. So there you go. So uh, thankfully, the authorities here don't really pay a lot of attention to that stuff. But, um, you know, you still don't want to you don't want to uh, tempt fate. That's the expression. Tempt fate. OK, some people want to talk. In fact, the first person was pure blood, pure blood. Do you still want to talk? I'm going to allow you to speak even if you're not ready. Pure blood. You had some questions about Russian real estate and the history of Russian real estate, because I think I more or less talked about everything that i could think of hello pure blood once uh you come you coming on hey there hey so you had uh, a question or, a comment going, or something how's it going bro fine fine hey listen man thanks uh thanks for letting me speak and all that stuff right i i actually don't really have a comment uh concerning your present uh, subject I, I would i would like to ask you to reinstate me in your comments channel that's all let's uh, talk to uh so christopher uh give pure blood another chance but pure blood sorry man uh we have to have a somewhat uh let's just say legal uh discussion here and uh the amount of bs that uh, goes on sometimes just gets too high Okay, man. So we'll reinstate you, but uh, dude, forget, you, hold, on, hold, on, hold on, hold on. But if things get out of line and there gets to be all sorts of trash and all sorts of like, we need to kill this group of people. We can't do that. Sorry, it's against the law here. Well, hey, bro, I I, I don't actually think that I ever advocated uh, eliminating anybody. But nevertheless, uh, let me just say this, right? From now on, I'll. I'll I'll promise to behave, and uh, you always have a chance to to ban me again. Well, you, I guess so, but my mods do all that stuff. So, anyways, good talking to you. Uh, we'll uh, we'll let you go there because talking about who's been banned and who hasn't. Again, guys, I'm sorry. Uh, some of people get really offended that uh, mods ban them, but it's always for a good reason. I trust my moderators; they're part of my team. They've helped me a lot and uh, building this sort of YouTube platform, so I give my guys a lot of faith. I'm the softy here, and I usually let people back on later, but, you know, or some people, they don't seem to see the problem of when things get really toxic, it really drags everything down. It's unfortunate. Uh, I, you, when you create a platform, I think a lot of people, even the man who made Telegram, Mr. Durov, wanted you know to make a, a, a platform for complete and total free speech away from government eyes and all this other stuff. And that sounds great, but the thing is, uh, online, uh, when things aren't face-to-face, -face, um, like sometimes things get real toxic real quick for various different reasons. And... Uh, the problem is, 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 is what's with that is the human mind is very strange because even if people in the chat are really toxic, they associate then that with me. So all of a sudden I'm Mr. Kill this person, kill that person, or uh, we need to do X, Y, and Z evil act or whatever. And uh, unfortunately, the, the human mind is very irrational. And that's why we have censorship. If we were perfectly rational, we wouldn't need it. Another one you wanted to talk. Another one, if you want to still talk, you're on the air. Hello. Hey, Tim, how are you? Hi. This, um, how are you? Fine, everything's fine. Hey, let me, hey, let me ask a quick question. Wait, what's the most poverty city for foreigners coming to Russia? I oh. imagine it's Moscow. Is that correct assumption? Uh, yeah, yeah, you should check out a recent video I made. I sh don't even know the title of it because I am a twit, uh, but I talked about, like, why foreigners uh, generally almost always go to Moscow or St. Petersburg because really, as I've been doing this whole thing about getting involved with the actual trying to make these mm, adjustments to laws about immigration and helping people out with that and the, uh, my attempts to make the American village happen and all this stuff, I've kind of seen a lot of horror stories from people outside of Moscow St. Petersburg, and the regions around them, the Leningradsky Oblast and the Moskovsky Oblast. Once you get out of there, everything just becomes this just nightmare. 
And it's really, really frustrating and heartbreaking. So the thing is, is you have to take this with a grain of salt, is it's kind of like, I think Moscow is popular because it's doable, if that makes sense. Like, uh, just every time, especially if you, uh, like people, because the Caucasus Mountains are beautiful, anything even close, even Krasnodarsky Krai, which is flat as a plate, uh, like as flat as a dinner plate, Right? But it's still kind of close to the Caucasus. It's such a nightmare trying for anyone to try to move there. Um, one of our uh, regular listeners, uh, I won't mention their name because it's uh, my business, but they're even married to a Russian. And they had an absolute horror fest of trying to immigrate there. So, yeah, it's really Moscow is top tier along with St. Petersburg. Uh, because it's just the most viable, I think, ultimately. Uh, and because, uh, you know, it's a good place to find a job if you maybe have an accent. Uh, I, have you know, was recently, I, I shouldn't mention what region of Russia. I'll put it this way, the some of the people that I mentioned in that previous video who were leaving Russia because they got really bad advice, especially from a lot of Russians, uh, they were not in those regions that I mentioned. And so, you know, there's just no jobs if you're not fluent in Russian just nothing um, you know and the reason i asked because i was looking um um around places around the black sea and specifically um i'm looking at um krasnodar krasnodar i, I just mentioned krasnodarsky cry yeah you will be screwed uh, over they will put you through the ringer so you don't go there i'm sorry man i have never heard a good story from krasnodarsky cry once not one it was very unfortunate because the problem is that um, I've heard of that region because normally they're very because I'm from Miami, so maybe the cold go to cold Moscow region is not up. I heard it's like very very moderate temperature. Well, well the thing is, is is if someone uh, really loves uh, Russia that much, okay, and they're really excited mm -hmm. about a life here, I would say to someone is is you have to get through that in you have to get over this massive hurdle of the immigration barrier, and then once you're a citizen, everything's different. Once you're a citizen, you can live wherever the hell you want. And so it might be one of those one things where I would say if you, in terms of making it, e in terms of making it like easy, uh, it would be best for you to go somewhere like again, Moscow, St. Petersburg or the regions around them uh, uh, t in order to uh, make it happen and then move down south. You know, and it could also give you the chance to kind of tour the entire south because even in some places like, um, like the Crimea, um, I'm not an expert on the Crimea, but every little place there is different than the others, you know? Um, so that's all I can tell you. I can't stop you, but uh, again, the other thing too is, uh, how are you going to move there? Or do you have like a girlfriend from there and you're going to get married or what's the plan? Well, I, I, well, eventually my plan will be once I get citizen, uh, citizenship and move to that region. Oh, well, that's right. Yeah, did, yeah, once you have citizenship, you can go wherever you want within Russia. No, mm -hmm. it doesn't mm -hmm. matter. Thank, thank you. And are you familiar with the area? Because I've seen a lot of videos on it, but have you ever been to that region before? Uh, yeah, I've been to it. Uh, uh, in fact, uh, wasn't that the... I forget where Novorossiysk is. Hold on. Novorossiysk. Is that in the region? Gorod Vrasit. Oh, boy. Hold on. Wikipedia is coming. Krasnodarsk. Yeah. So, uh, I, in fact, uh, when last uh, year when I won the Minor League American Football Championship along with my Moscow Spartans reservists, uh, we played uh, in one of the cities down there. So, yeah, it was definitely warmer than Moscow. Uh, but, um, you know, I don't know. A lot of uh, a lot of life in Russia is uh, being able to have a job. So you could have a job down there. Cool. Uh, but, you you know, if you again, if you want to try to find a job outside of Moscow and St. Petersburg, your Russian better be on point. Well, uh, in terms of independently wealthy, so that wouldn't be an issue. Oh, okay, um, cool. However... Well, in terms of uh, frequent uh, fluency of Russian language, I imagine the further you work, the further you get away from Moscow, the the more your Russian is needed. Correct? Is that accurate assessment? Yeah, but even in Moscow, it's needed. Uh, I think maybe some people in Moscow might be more merciful, or there might be kind of you know more um, even to this day uh, more international companies that are kind of looking for people to do stuff like that. That you know, mm -hmm. um, whereas if you are in uh, let me pick a Izhevsk, okay, we're gonna take somewhere where you know, like most of the business there. Maybe there are some big factories where they're making those uh, the, the 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 cars for trains, you know, and the uh, all those different train cars and all that. I think are made in Izhevsk. But the thing is, is it's like I don't know. Maybe they have one person at that factory who speaks English bad, and that's good enough for them to do international business. Like there's there's not an international like 
flair that would uh, make English useful or a positive. Whereas in Moscow, despite sanctions and all that, there's still international businesses here and where English might be a plus. Thank you. Thank you for much for your, your advice. I really appreciate yeah, sure that. Thing, man. All the best. And I wish you the best uh, because I would love it if uh, another one was able to get citizenship and then out of spite, move down to the forbidden regions of the South where the migration services wouldn't want him. <laughs> I love spite and revenge. <laughs> you know, you're not supposed to as a Christian, but it's still, well, that's, that's a, that's a positive spite. That's uh, fighting the evil forces of, uh, I don't even know what it is. I don't think it's corruption. I think it's just weirdness. <laughs> no one, no one doing their job properly. Um, anyways, uh, let's see. Do we have any message? Oh no, everything vanished. Why did I do that? That's one thing I do not like about um, at all about Windows 10 is if you sometimes start holding a window too long, everything vanishes. That is a terrible feature. There's probably a way to turn it off, but I am not a genius. Okay, so here we go. Ah, here we are. Finally, now it's in front of my face. Uh, Christopher writes, D&D campaign, a DM in the field is a gazebo player. I shoot the gazebo with an arrow. DM, the arrow thunks into the gazebo with no effect. Other player, fireball centered on the gazebo. Yes, Christopher, I, I know what you're referring to. Yes, yes, that, that that's uh, very good. Um, and it is a little bit like D&D placement, how you put things on your in your house. Jill asks, uh, restrictions on how many roosters you can have. Uh, that completely depends on the zoning of the place you live um, and, uh, there should be no restriction on how many, how many livestock you own in general. If you own land that is specifically for the purpose of farming, that should not matter. I, I have heard one weird story where some foreign people, again, not around Moscow, not around St. Petersburg bought animals, but some weird people from the government came and told them they can't do that's lawsuit time. Uh, but I can't help people who aren't around Moscow with that sort of thing. So, uh, that's ridiculous because in Russia, you can, I'm pretty sure you can just buy as many animals as you want. Uh, obviously there are certain standards about the health of the animals cause you can't sell, sell poisoned meat. Uh, but, um, yeah. Is the Chook house considered storage? I don't know. Chook house. This is a new term for me at 42 years old. I am learning new things. Uh, so that's well in uh, Ohio, we would call that a hen house. Uh, but anyways, uh, if there are standards for them, I don't know. I don't think anyone cares. Uh, I, I uh, you know, and a lot of people who, uh, in Russia live on subsistence farming, their hen house is made out of whatever they can find. So mm, there you go. In a home I live in, the number is zero in terms of roosters, but yeah. In a um, uh, uh, urban or suburban environment, uh, there's uh, no chickens. In fact, let me check one last thing. Uh, I hate when it does that. It won't switch, switch over to Russian. Можно ли иметь куриц на даче? So, from the beginning of 2024... Uh, yeah, you can't, uh, at a dacha, you can't have chickens anymore. No animals for food. You have to have farmland for that. As of 2024, they changed that. So, due to popular complaint. So, yes, dachas are only for them veggies now. But, um, yeah. Um, Michael O'Donohue. Are you familiar with conditions or restrictions concerning refrigerated cold rooms on farms? No, but there are plenty of them. And... Uh, dude, I've been to a lot of, uh, a lot. I've been to a few, uh, farms in Russia, like farm farms. Uh, and I've been to three different farms where they produce cheese and the cold rooms were all made. Basically the person who owned it just like kind of put it together. They got the refrigerating elements. They organized the room themselves. Basically it was all sort of, you know, made by the owner. So apparently the standards aren't crazy difficult. Uh, if, uh, some guys can slap together that kind of architecture, uh, you can too. Tim, come to the dark side. Try Linux instead of Windows. I'm not 100% opposed to that. Uh, I'm just really, uh, at my age, not super uh, enthused to learn a new operating system. Um, if I had like a second computer and it was maybe technically better than this one in terms of its stats and I had Linux on it, I'd learn it. But for now, we're going to stick to Windows. 
A Richard, I thought tomorrow was the Yandex. It is. Tomorrow is a, no, tomorrow is the discussion about the whole homes and the American village and its in its new iteration and what we're going to do uh, because, guys, we've done it. Uh, the the uh, developer is finally happy. Uh, Timur is happy. He's got all the documents. I'm happy. Everyone is finally happy. All the ducks are finally in a row. So we're going to talk about that uh, tomorrow. And again, my nose is itching. And uh, one of the problems with that is uh, in Russia, if your nose itches, uh, that means you're lying. I'm telling you the truth that we're going to have that live stream tomorrow because finally all the ducks are in a row and we can finally do this thing after two years. But of course, uh, it is not the Serpukhov build a whole city within Russia concept. Unfortunately, that uh, the true original idea is uh, not going to happen. It is going to be smaller and around Istra and already part of an, a pre-existing uh, community of dachas. So, yeah. Um, some kind of sarcastic comment they don't understand. The Aussie term for chicken is chook. Okay, you guys are, uh... I'll put it this way. During college, we had a very long list of uh, Australian terminology. And to this day, we laugh at certain ones. But they're not nice. So uh, I'll keep that to myself. Mr. Martinez writes, Tim, you could run Linux on a virtual machine... Uh, within your windows to start with just like yeah i used to run on my mac computers i used to run virtual windows um for a while but again that that's one of those things where i don't enjoy doing stuff like that i ran virtual windows because i really had to for a reason i can't remember but basically i had to do it for work i think um so yeah i uh I'm, I'm not going to do that again. Uh, it was cool. It was kind of neat to do. But uh, again, I'm not interested in playing uh, games with um, operating systems anymore. That is just something that I'm that I don't want to do anymore. So with Windows 10, you can install Ubuntu. Yeah, may, maybe you can. But um, again, that's uh, not super what I'm interested in doing. So yeah. Um, and then too, uh, as you may have mentioned, guys, I sort of complain about oh, I have very little free time. Uh, to really uh, work on a lot of stuff, or I'm just kind of tired from work. Uh, I kind of consider that to be kind of like work vibes, like re you know, uh, getting a, a dual operating system set up. Um, it's uh, there's a lot of things in life that I need to do and I can't get done because I don't have enough time. And uh, let's just all this optional stuff. Let's just leave that. I'll leave it off the table. But again, to be clear, uh, this is not the live stream. The live stream tomorrow will feature, uh, it's going to be a call, so people are going to be able to call in, and it's going to feature uh, myself and Timur, so Timur is going to be there, because I am, uh, when it comes to this final discussion about how we're going to proceed, when it comes to the legal issues of how this is all done legally on both the western side and the eastern side, and about the migration, all those questions have to go to Timur, because he's the real expert, uh, I do not... Um, uh, guys, I'm not going to play pretend and be like, definitely, I know a lot more about, I would say, immigration in Russia than the average person does. Uh, but I, you know, uh, there's a difference between being an enthusiast and being a real, you know, bona fide expert. And that's what Timur is. And so we're going to have him there uh, because I think a lot of answers that I have, uh, you kind of have to take a little bit with a grain of salt. Uh, because, again, sometimes I get confused because all the laws change. And that really throws me for a loop. You know, I'll be remembering, I'm like, well, I remember someone couldn't do this in the past, but but can they now? Like one big thing that keeps coming up is I've heard from people that they, they want work, that they, they implemented that whole thing about you need to have now a wife and a kid to move to Russia. But, you know, you can't find it in the laws. But in the past, stuff that wasn't in the laws was mandatory too. So I guess that's not true and people were lying to me or they were saying something that could happen did happen so again guys uh, i don't want to take the role of uh, immigration expert when people's lives are on the line when we have two more to do that uh the owner of the construction company may be present he may not i told him that wasn't mandatory because i don't even know if he speaks english so <laughs> you know uh, that's a whole different thing uh, Christopher says mortgages and oh I forgot oh my gosh Christopher because see in Russia you, you don't worry about money <laughs> you don't worry about money because one thing I forgot to mention is that in Russia you can build a home in phases 
First you build the foundation, and then maybe in three years you have enough money for the for the walls of the first floor, leave it outside there for a couple years, and then uh, put the second floor on in the roof. <laughs> Very Russian way of building. Uh, and uh, one thing that is the difference is, yeah, mortgages in Russia are absolutely brutal right now. I think they're at like 16%. Uh, the best they ever were on average was like 7%. So thank you, Christopher. Very good point. Uh, something I should have mentioned earlier, but mortgages are brutal. And, but at least uh, they're pretty easy to get. Uh, if you have a job in Russia and you've worked for at least six months at that job, a white salary job, though, you have to prove that you're making money for the last six months uh, and prove it to the bank. But then again, the bank's not the government. They're less bureaucratic than the government is, if you can believe that. Um, and prove to the bank that you're a uh, viable person uh they'll give it to you but remember if you are not here as a citizen you're not very viable <laughs> yeah that's uh one of the other problems of course it would be amazing if uh loans were given out like candy in russia in russia like they uh, were in the united states for many years even to foreign people but no uh, because in russia the liability is very much on the side of the bank so if the bank gives you a bad loan and you don't pay it off it's kind of the bank's problem so there you go. Uh, you, of course, your life will be unhappy, but uh, the government is not going to bail out the bank or let's just say the government's not going to help much in getting that money uh, squeezed out of you. So, yeah, another big difference. But anyways, guys, I think we kind of tackled all these issues. Let me see if someone's hand is raised. Stop maximizing. Stop maximizing. No, no one's hand is raised. That's fantastic. So that means I'm going to go, guys. It was great talking to you. Uh, I think this was a good discussion, big topic that I happen to know a lot about. Uh, so let me know for next live stream. Anyways, Tim Kirby Russia, signing out.